Buongiorno. Buongiorno Legano. Today I'm going to talk about social scalability and trusted third parties in Bitcoin. And first let's talk about monkey brains. There is an advanced part of the brain, a social part of the brain called the neocortex that's especially large in humans. If you take the ratio of the size of the social part of the brain to the size of the rest of the brain and then plot it against the group size of how many monkeys together form a group, it forms a nice uh, correlated line. And if you project this out to human size of the human uh, neocortex, you get a group size of 150. So if we live like monkeys or live like in a uh, traditional village, actually, with uh, knowing people all our lives, um, having repeated long-term interactions with people, the, the amount of social interaction we could handle uh, at that level would be 150 people. But of course, we don't actually live like that in the modern world. We live uh, with uh, much larger but looser groups. Um, we have looser um, relationships with a lot more people. And so how do we do that? What price do we pay for, prices do we pay for doing that, and can we do it better? So overcoming human cognitive limits to how many people can participate, successfully participate in an institution, uh, the famous Dunbar number of, uh, of around 150 people, um, requires innovation. It requires technological innovation or institutional innovation. Um, institutions being organizations or groups of organizations. Um, then the evolution of human institutions has been a slow, painful process going on for tens of thousands of years. And still very imperfect, as anybody who uh, watches the news uh, knows. Um, so we live in ever-changing groups of people we don't know very well relative to the traditional uh, village. And the more part-time our business relationships or other relationships are with somebody, the less well we know them. Um, so we can think of ourselves as living in a social fog. We deal with groups of semi-strangers through institutions and technologies that can help us cut through that fog. And that gives rise to dilemmas, especially the dilemma of trust. <laughs> Who can you trust? <laughs> Who can you trust when you're operating on such large social scales? What works on a small scale, the instincts we have developed, uh, the social techniques we have developed that work well on a lar small scale usually work quite poorly on, on a large social scale. Case in point, how can you not trust this guy? Look at that saintly smile. And look at that t-shirt. His heart is literally in the right place. The trouble is these kinds of personal evidence we use to trust people on a small social scale, well, they don't scale. They don't work nearly so well on a large scale. Um, as Adam Smith pointed out, um, we're in a modern society, we're dependent on the goods and services we buy, so we need the cooperation of multitudes, even though our whole life and our whole brain power are barely sufficient to gain the friendship of a few people. So it's a vain to expect this large-scale help from the benevolence, as Adam Smith would say, that works well on small social scales. So we obtain, obtain these goods and surfaces mainly through market exchanges. It's been the most efficient way we've obtained them. Um, so think about, for example, all the engineers and mechanics you depend on when you drive a car or take a bus or fly a plane. That, that engine sitting in there invisible inside, but it's actually the work of thousands of engineers and mechanics and uh, manufacturing factories, uh, workers, and, and so on, and all the people they depend on too. And you're dependent on thousands of these things in your life, the, many of which are complicated. Leonard Reed wrote a beautiful essay called I Pencil about how even a pencil depends on multitudes of people um, all over the world typically to uh, manufacture them, complete, complete all the steps. Um, so social scalability um, comes from things that allow us to overcome these cognitive shortcomings. 
Um, it's about how our institutions motivate or constrain us. Do they motivate us to uh, cooperate with other people to build things or provide services? Do they prevent us from harming other people? This limits who or how many can successfully participate. It's going to end not just having a seat at the table or an engineering, um, typical naive engineering scaling argument, well, we can fit fit more people on our website or more we have more bandwidth or whatever. And this is about how you can successfully participate in a large-scale institution um, much more than we otherwise could. And it's about human limitations and the way we deal with each other. It's not about the raw capacity of the technology to handle so many users. So some examples of institutions that have allowed us to social scale markets, obviously what Adam Smith talked about, law, accounting, and uh, the big example for this presentation, money, are four examples of institutions that have allowed us to scale beyond our cognitive limits and deal with far, be able, come to cooperate and depend on far more people in the world. And so these institutions at their best are not based on blind trust. They're based on careful evidence gathering. So if you look at in, um, what accountants do and what lawyers do and what uh, um, police investigators do, they're gathering evidence. They're very careful. They, they record things. They gather evidence. They think about it. And so the institutions, when they're successful, are the very opposite of blind trust. They're ver gathering careful evidence. They're verifying things. Um, and so that leads to uh, our ability to make deals um, with, with lots of different people. And in particular, we need socially scalable money. Even before Columbus, silver, a trust minimized money, created a pan-Eurasian trade network called the Silk Road that spanned all the way from China to Europe. And after Columbus, silver spread around the world. It was transformed into a variety of different objects, culturally distinct ways of storing, displaying, or hiding, and transferring the silver. So the non-sovereign, the non-cultural part of the money, the substance itself, silver, the trust-minimized part, that was money all over the planet. Um, but it took different forms in different places. In the Western cultures, we had raw ingots and various kinds of coins. In the Persian Gulf and the Indian Oceans, um, Laren wires that you could put over a fire and look up and see if the silver was genuine. And in China, some different kinds of coins and uh, Saisi ingots um, were some of the many examples of the forms that silver took. But it was rather insecure. Aztecs collected gold from weak subject tribes. Spanish looted the Aztecs. The British looted the Spanish. In World War I and II, German subs sunk a bunch of British uh, ships full of gold, um, helping to sink the gold standard. And so uh, uh, these, these institutions, in, including money, have been very imperfect. And so these, almost every of uh, these large-scale institutions serves a valuable service in making the greatly expanded cooperation that Adam Smith and others have described possible. But they are often pretentious. They suggest that they know things that they don't actually know, that they, they suggest that they can do things they can't actually do, at least not without, not without creating even greater risks or causing even greater harms. So, and this critique applies to more or less all human-mediated institutions that operate on large social scales. But for this talk, I'm going to pick on journalism, regulation, and crypto exchanges. Um, sadly, um, well, let's, let's look at, uh, this is the Nobel Prize winner, Frederick Hayek, and he coined the phrase pretense of knowledge, um, which well describes what, what a lot of these institutions are doing. And... Uh, a great example of this is journalism. Um, they pretend to know people well when their actual experience with those people are, are quite superficial. Um, and even beyond that, um, photographs and videos that you get on mass media, um, they suggest to us um, that we trust strangers on the same basis we would, we would trust somebody that uh, we know well and deal on a face-to-face a -face basis, based on a, seeing a face, based on a smile. And so not only is there a pretense of knowledge in mass media, there's a pretense of intimacy. Um, so 
mass media can mislead us by using signals of trust that have worked for us on small social scales and suggesting to us that we apply them on, on larger social scales. And another big pretense uh, is the magical aura surrounding regulation. We are regulated. We are compliant. It sounds so, uh, so trustworthy. Uh, Sam Bankman Fried's parents are compliance lawyers. Like, if anybody knows all the labyrinthine regulation in the United States, it must be Sam Bankman Fried's parents. And so, how can you get more trustworthy than that, right? And, uh, yeah, sounds very reliable and trustworthy. <clears throat> and he hangs out with prime ministers and presidents. These are good people. These are regulated people. These are compliant people. Are you compliant? So the fog and the fantasy are particularly thick around that particular crowd, but alas, the social fog problem is ubiquitous at large social scales. Um, what works on a small scale usually does not work so well when you uh, try to cut through the fog at a large social scale. And outright failure uh, is not the only problem that central ex centralized exchanges have. They think they know better than you how to handle your money. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. The lawyers think they know better than the exchanges how your money should be handled. Uh, I don't think either of these thoughts are particularly reliable. And then we have the bureaucratic armies called fiat currencies. And we love to pick on the dollar and the euro, but those are by no means the worst offenders. And one of the biggest problem, trust problems we have these days with the uh, fiat currency is inflation. Um, the Turkish lira had an inflation rate of 89% last year. The Argentine peso, 88%. The Iranian real, 52%. Venezuelan bolivar, 156%. Zimbabwe dollar, 269%. So uh, if you think inflation in the euro and dollar have been bad, uh, you ain't seen nothing yet. And uh, ch -ch -ch. so these fiat currencies are based on these big foggy bureaucracies on, on accounting and uh, law enforcement and uh, lawyers and so on. But the bureaucracy just gets worse when you try to cross borders. So this is the labyrinthine, um, actually a very abstract and oversimplified diagram, a labyrinthine um, bureaucracy used to transmit dividend payments across national borders. So only a small fraction of companies in the world could actually afford to, to issue stock can actually afford to do this. So that's a quite limiting factor on how, how uh, global we can scale the financial system in term, when it comes to stocks. And similarly for bond coupons. And so let's briefly look at another way that centralization is insecure and unreliable. Um, Philip Zimmerman talked yesterday about the web of trust, a, a decentralized um, way to handle uh, public key infrastructure yesterday. But most of the industry for uh, user friendliness reasons is adopted for, for the centralized um, system. For example, the HTTPS protocol in your web browser. Um, it assumes a trusted third party called a certificate authority to vouch for identity, but identity is local and unreliable, so these aren't the most reliable things. And they also become, the, so these um, certificate authorities become the highest cost and highest risk portion of the public key infrastructure, and they're also used to censor websites unpopular with the authorities. So um, very, very imperfect, limited way to, to socially scale cryptography. And we can go back to uh, 1917 to a great example of the insecurity of centralization. Back then, capitalism took particularly centralized forms in terms of railroads, in terms of the, the steam press, the printing press, that a small number of, of uh, printing presses served uh, millions of people. And so if you were uh, a radical ideologue or a mutinous soldier, all you had to do was take over uh, who wanted to overthrow the uh, democratic government there. All you had to do was take over a few railroad stations and a few newspaper presses and the central bank, and boom, you're in control. You're in control of what people can see and read. Um, you're in control, control of where they can travel. 
And so large, large centralized companies are the security holes of capitalism. And the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917 was a particularly violent example of that. So the main way we achieve social scalability is by security, broadly defined, including all those steps from accounting controls to lawyers to police forces that we've used to protect property and contracts, and especially money. But when it comes to our money, we can have something much more trustworthy now. Thanks to Satoshi, gave us a technology of a really spectacular advance in social scalability. And you can think of Bitcoin as an army of robots checking up on each other's work, verifying each other's work. And this creates a seamlessly global network of verified monetary transactions, um, unforgeable. So you can send money between Cleveland and Cape Town seamlessly, or between Lugano and Los Angeles, doesn't matter, it's seamless. And so a good public blockchain like Bitcoin traps transactions in an immutable record, like flies trapped in amber. By contrast, the traditional database uh, is computational, which most of the financial system is still based on, is computational etch-a-sketch. Whoever controls it can revise or erase its memory at will. And so alas, now we got to come to the lowest level of hell of uh, large-scale institutions, namely uh, war and the fog of war. So who did shoot that missile? Who did blow up that hospital? Just because our monkey brains have strong opinions on these matters doesn't mean that we actually know. Trust scales poorly, especially when we get into heated political disagreements. So what we need at large social scales for institutions we actually want to rely on is strong and nonviolent security. And that's what uh, Bitcoin gives us. Computer science has made it possible for our money to have that strong but nonviolent security. Each Bitcoin full node is able to independently verify the integrity of the entire Bitcoin blockchain. Bitcoin is trust minimized. It's immutably verifiable, allowing its security to easily scale to global proportions. Whereas, alas, governments often have trouble just getting along with their neighbors. One of the consequences of Bitcoin's superior social scalability is its outsized returns. So this may be the strongest price signal ever sent in the history of finance uh, over the history of Bitcoin from 2009 to today. Um, consistently over four to five year periods, far out distancing uh, other asset classes and returns. So let's listen to what the Bitcoin protocol is telling us. It's telling us that we're, when we're when we're operating on small social scales, we can trust our instincts. We know who to trust and who not to trust because we know the people well. But when we're operating on large social scales, don't trust. Verify. Thank you very much.